Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Liaison Committee, Prime Minister. Um, I know that we have a huge number of questions to get through, so if you don't mind, we will start straight away with Hilary Benn. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Prime Minister. You made a very clear commitment in the Brexit Phase 1 joint report to maintaining no hard border, no infrastructure, no checks between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Now, we all hope that will be achieved by a free trade agreement, but you've also committed to a very specific fallback option, this question of full alignment. And I just wanted to explore what that would involve. Now, you indicated in your statement to the House that this would apply to agricultural goods, for example. Is that correct? Well, first of all, can I congratulate you, Chairman, on your uh, election as Chairman of the uh, Liaison Committee. Yeah. Um, yes, if I look at the question of what we've uh, put into the Joint Progress Report on Northern Ireland, of course, there are three stages in terms of looking at the uh, uh, commitment on no border, no hard border between uh, Northern Ireland and uh, the Republic of Ireland. The first is, as you say, the, uh, that we expect and intend to be able to achieve this through the negotiations on the overall arrangement between the EU and the UK. The second is, in uh, the second fallback, which you didn't refer to in your question, is failing that we would look at specific solutions for the unique circumstance of Northern Ireland, and failing that we fall into the full alignment, um, uh, as was said in the progress report. It's, I think sometimes when this is being discussed, people forget there are already um, specific uh, differences in relation to and specific solutions for Northern Ireland. The all-island of Ireland electricity market, for example, is already in existence. Um, there are already some arrangements in relation to, uh, to agriculture. But as to what would be necessary in terms of looking at those, those arrangements, were we to have to fall back to that third option, and I emphasise it is the third option, those, of course, will be a matter that we would need to look at and negotiate at the time. Our focus is on the first option, i.e., now we can start, we've got sufficient progress, we can start to look at the overall relationship between us and the European Union. That is, uh, that is where we'll be putting our work and effort and focus. Indeed. Um, but since the government's made a very clear commitment to no infrastructure, no checks, no controls, in all circumstances, all three of those you've just laid out, I'm just focusing on the full alignment uh, fallback. And the question I just put again, would that cover agricultural goods, yes or no? Well, uh, the reason I answered in the way I did yes. is because... Of course, that is still in the progress report, but I don't want people to assume that this is the process, that this is the solution that we are working I, towards. I do understand. We're working that. towards the first round. The um, issues such as um, the agricultural trade, <coughs> the movement of agricultural, agricultural uh, livestock and, and goods between and to need for the agri-food industry between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is obviously an issue that we would have to be looking at. But as to what, how we would achieve the uh, objectives that we both want to achieve in those circumstances, um, that will be a matter for negotiation should we actually get into that position. Should it become clear that neither of the first two options are available for us or are going to be possible. I'm sure that we're going to be able to achieve the first option. We've already put forward some ideas uh, as to how we can achieve this. Uh, we've published papers on this. And uh, now that we've got sufficient progress, now we're out of phase one of the negotiations, we can actually start to look at these in detail because the problem we've had so far is whereas we've been putting ideas forward, actually we haven't been able to negotiate or discuss these with uh, the, uh, the other side in these negotiations because they've been clear we've been in phase one. Now we can actually start doing that uh, in earnest. So are, are you telling us that actually you can't say at this stage whether it would cover agricultural goods or, for example, manufactured goods? Because, as I understood it, the purpose of putting in the fallback option was to offer assurance in all circumstances to all of those involved. If you're saying you, you can't tell us what it covers, then what exactly does it mean? Well, it means... I don't know. It means that there will be, we will ensure that there is no hard border. How we achieve that in specific areas and specific sectors would be a means for the uh, negotiations. That's uh, what I'm saying in my answers to you. We're clear that in terms of no hard border. As I say, we believe we can achieve that uh, in the overall relationship, and we've put forward some ideas as to how that can be done. 
we're now able to discuss those specific ideas. Uh, and that's, this is about no hard border, no physical infrastructure. But surely, Prime Minister, if it doesn't cover all goods, those that are excluded would then, of necessity, be subject to checks. And therefore, your commitment that you've given to there being no hard border, no checks, no controls, could not be delivered. Either everything is in or it, everything isn't in. It's a it's very simple question about how this would work. Yes, and it's a very simple answer. We're, what we are going to deliver is no hard border, no physical infrastructure at the border. So, all right, well then you, you can't confirm what, what it would cover. Um, can I move on now to timing? Now, the EU Commission has, in its draft negotiating guidelines published this morning, has said that the transitional arrangements should last no longer than the 31st of December 2020. Do you think that that will be long enough? Well, I've, as you know, uh, I think as you know full well, in my Florence speech, I said that I thought that probably the implementation period would be around two years. Right. That was what the um, <coughs> indications we had at the time. Uh, we're about to start the negotiations, and uh, the, uh, obviously what we've seen uh, today is that position coming from the, uh, from the European uh, Union. We will be in negotiations as to what, uh, and quickly into negotiations, as to what the implementation period should cover. They've set that end December 2020 date because that covers their current budget plan period. So that has a neatness for them, uh, if I can put it like that. Uh, but we will obviously have to discuss, because this is a practical, a practical issue, about how long certain changes would need to, uh, would need to take to be uh, put in place. But before you can make the changes, you have to have an agreement on the new free trade relationship, which is your number one objective. Do you think those negotiations can, can be completed in the, the implementation period, the transition period? Do you think there will be sufficient time to complete them? Sorry, you said sufficient time to complete I've, I've them in the implementation in period. In the implementation period, because, or to ask the question another way, is it still your view that you can complete negotiating a free trade agreement by March 2019? It is. That is our. Uh, that is what we are working to, and that is what I believe we can do. And I believe that's important. I believe everybody wants to know on what basis they're going to be, uh, what basis they're going to be operating in the future, such that the implementation period <coughs> is a practical period, which is implementing, going towards implementing the agreement that we <coughs> have with the European <coughs> Union. I've said, I and other ministers have said, made the point in the past that, of course, we start off from a different point from other third countries as we will be uh, from other third countries negotiating with the European Union because we're already a member and already trading with them on a particular basis. Um, as you will know full well, there is, uh, um, uh, we can't legally sign the new trade agreement with the European Union until we're a third country, until we're out of the European Union, 29th of March uh, 2019. Uh, but I believe we can negotiate that uh, arrangement in, uh, in that time. Um now, that's the view that you hold and the government holds, but the view on the other side of the negotiating table is that the best that's going to be achieved by March 2019 is a scoping of what a free trade agreement is going to cover. And certainly I've met nobody who thinks it will be possible to negotiate all of the details of that by March 2019. Now, why is the government so confident that it can be done when those with whom it is negotiating don't think it can? Well, a lot is often said about the time that it takes to negotiate trade deals. There are different experiences around the world of the length of time it takes to negotiate trade deals. Um, as I say, the reason I'm confident that we can do this in, within the time uh, concerned is because, is because we start off from a different point. So we haven't got a situation where country A is coming to negotiate <coughs> with the EU not having had any arrangements with the EU before. We come from the point where we're actually a member of the European Union, we're operating on the same basis at the, uh, at the moment, and therefore I think that start, starts us off from a different position in terms of our negotiations on trade in the future. Of course, we're not just talking in phase two of negotiating the trade agreement, we're also talking about negotiating the future security uh, uh, partnership that we want to have with the European Union. And finally from me, were you aware that no impact assessments were being carried out by government departments looking at the 
impact, the effect of Brexit on different sectors of the economy or indeed on the implications of leaving the customs union? Did you know that that wasn't being done? Well, I was aware that the uh, that government departments were doing, <coughs> led of course by Dexu, um, was ensuring that they were in touch with different sectors and continue to be in touch with different sectors that are taking their views on uh, implications uh, for the, uh, in terms of what matters to them. This is what so is in the sectoral analysis which has been made available to your committee. Uh, that was the uh, analysis that, is, that uh, was undertaken and is indeed ongoing. We continue to talk to business. It isn't that there's a, a point in time where you say, well, what is the impact here? Um, actually, we didn't produce impact assessments as, as you've described them. We produced that sectoral analysis. We continue to talk with business. We continue to talk with uh, uh, representatives of all sectors on the issues that matter to them. Just observe that um, we're about to publish uh, most of what you've given to us, and I think the public will see there is no assessment of the impact of Brexit on the different sectors of the economy, but we can pursue that on another occasion. Thank you. Um, we're going to come on to a group of questions from Treasury, Bays and International Trade, starting with Nicky Morgan. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, on Monday in the House, you uh, said that, based on reasonable assumptions, the financial settlement is estimated to stand at between £35 billion and £39 billion in current terms. Over what period of time would you expect that amount of money to be paid to honour our obligations to the EU? The, uh, if you look at the joint progress report, it's, uh, it makes clear that none of the uh, payments that are required will be required from us until they fall due, um, unless there is an other agreement between the UK and the European Union that they will be paid at another time. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the implications, some of the elements in the financial settlement that have been looked at are elements that may arise at some stage in the future. Um, but the assessment that has been made is obviously has looked at those alongside the what most people would consider to be the um, more regular uh, payments, if I can describe them as that, because I made clear in my Florence speech that we didn't want anybody in the current budget plan to fear that as a result of us leaving, we were going, they were going to have to pay more or receive less from the, uh, in relation to their membership of the European Union. Which I entirely agree with. And, and the reason I'm asking is because um, obviously the Treasury Select Committee has taken evidence over the last few weeks on the budget and the recent OBR uh, fiscal outlook. Um, and in that uh, outlook, it taught the OBR uh, talk about taking a fiscally neutral approach that from 2019-20 onwards, any reduction in expenditure transfers to the EU would be recycled fully into extra domestic spending. And they have a, a chart whereby they anticipate uh, EU contributions ending in the year 1819, and then domestic spending rising or increased domestic spending from 2019-20 onwards. So one set of expenditure replacing the other. But, but it sounds to me from what you've just said as if that, that may not be the right way for the OBR to approach it on the basis we may be paying more money uh, in relation to our EU contributions over you know, some years to no, come. No, we won't be paying. I, mean, I wouldn't want you to go away with the impression that there's a lengthy period of time over which each year we are going to be paying money to the European Union. That is not going to be the case. Um, but the, uh, to the extent that the financial settlement covers payments uh, that we would have made as a member state and we won't be required to pay more or sooner than we would have had to as a member state, then the settlement is already provided for in the budget forecast. Um, it is not the case that, that these sums of money are additional to that budget forecast, because they're baked in. The OBR has already baked in payments. But the OBR's baking in of anticipated future domestic spending may not, may not be, be correct, so, so that may be something that the OBR might have to revisit in their future fiscal outlooks. Is that, would you agree with that? Well, what the OBR has done is taken a fiscally neutral approach to this. So they've said uh, that the, the, any savings that are made from not paying to the European Union will be uh, recast into, recycled into um, domestic spending. Uh, they haven't assumed how that particular uh, expenditure will be used. Um, but they, as I say, this, the, the, the sums are covered over the period of time. There will be, as the Joint Progress Report makes clear, uh, a point at which a decision on the timing of those um, would be possible if it was uh, felt appropriate to change that timing from what is in the agreement so far. Let me move on to something else which is obviously in the news today, which is financial services. And the financial services sector paid £72 billion in taxes to the UK government uh, last year. 
Um, and I think it's one area that you would agree where actually we are already operating on the same basis as the uh, EU. In fact, the UK has been very influential on uh, EU financial services uh, legislation. Now, Michel Barnier has said this morning that he doesn't expect a free trade agreement to cover financial services. How are you going to persuade him that that's not a wise course of action? Well, we're going into a negotiation, I think, and the... What I would say is that the City of London is obviously important to us here in the UK, but actually it's a, of significant importance to the rest of the European Union as well. I'm afraid I, I don't have the exact quote, but I understand that the Governor of the Bank of England has commented on this um, earlier today, yeah. and I think used a phrase such as, you know, the City of London is actually the banker for, for Europe, uh, as, and there's significant... Um, it's a significant provider of capital finance for Europe, uh, and I think the... Uh, as we come into discussions, there will be a greater recognition of the role that the city plays in the financial provisions for Europe as a whole and not just for the United Kingdom. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're now going okay. to move on to Rachel Reeves. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Prime Minister, for coming to give evidence today. Uh, our Select Committee wow. has taken uh, evidence from a number of business organisations and businesses. And the, um, Association of British Pharmaceutical Industries said um, on the issue of, um, of regulation, it would really not make sense for us to have something where we had a divergent uh, regulation. You, Prime Minister, have spoken about um, regulatory alignment. I wonder precisely what does that mean and how is it different, if it is, from what we have today? Well, the, what I set out in the Florence speech was that if we look at the question of regulations and directives, there will be, they fall into different categories. There are some of those that are of uh, no impact on trade relations, have no relevance to trade relations. There will be some areas where we have the same goals, the same objectives in terms of regulation, but wish to achieve them by different means. There will be other areas where we have the same goals and accept that they should be achieved by the same means. As part of the negotiations, we now go into the process of looking at that in detail and just determining, as one would in any trade agreement, any trade agreement, there is an agreement as to the, rule, the regulations, the standards on which that trade is going to take place. That's what we will now be doing um, with the European Union. So uh, regulatory, regulatory alignment could mean that we have different rules and regulations here compared with... Uh, what they have in the other European Union uh, countries. Regulatory alignment might include, uh, under what you've set out, different rules and regulations here compared with what's on the rest of the continent. <coughs> alignment means that we have uh, the same objectives. We may achieve, achieve those objectives by the same means, or we may choose to achieve those objectives by different means. Uh, in any trade agreement, that will be part of the discussion that takes place, part of the negotiation that takes place, and it will be no different here. So when we took evidence from the Food and Drink Federation, they said that convergence is a good thing, convergence of regulations is a good thing because it brings down the cost. If we have different rules and regulations, even if we have the same objectives, Prime Minister, that might mean higher costs for industry. The food and drink industry uh, seem to think that. Uh, in the car manufacturing sector, they spoke about semi-catastrophic uh, effects of having to stop um, um, production if EU-type approvals weren't able to be provided by the UK vehicle certification. They are worried, businesses are worried, about us diverging from the rules and regulations. Even if we have the same objectives, they're worried about diverging from the specific rules and regulations because that will make it harder for trade. Is that what businesses are saying to you, Prime Minister? Do you understand well, their I, concerns? Can I? Um, what businesses want to be able to do is to continue to trade uh, as, on a, as tariff-free and as frictionless a basis with the European Union as they are able to do today. Mm. Um, in one of the examples that you cited, I think you, you, it showed how this can be achieved in a number of ways because it, it referenced UK uh, authorities being able to deliver if you like, the standards that are expected in the European Union. This is, uh, in any trade relationship, in order to be able to have that uh, trade on uh, the basis that is negotiated, uh, agreements will be reached as to what the standards are, what the regulations under which that trade takes place. This will be no different. What we're going into now is a negotiation which will look at different areas uh, and will, um, and we're very clear that will be goods and services, 
uh, and we'll obviously we'll be discussing how we achieve uh, that trade and what that overall trading relationship should be. The reason why the uh, Vehicle Certification Agency in the UK can give those type of approvals is because we are a member of the European Union. It's similar with other areas, for example, uh, the European Aviation uh, um, Safety Agency or the uh, European Medicines Agency. Uh, in the House last week, uh, your Brexit Minister, uh, Dominic Raab, said that where there is a demonstrable national interest in pursuing a continued relationship with an agency or other EU body, the government will look very carefully um, at that. Will the government look at whether um, we might remain in things like uh, the European European Aviation Safety Agency or the European Medical Schools Agency or indeed IRATA? Are, are those possibilities, are, that, are any of those still on the table? Well, I would, if I may differentiate between the various bodies that, that you have cited there. I mean, on the um, European Aviation Safety Agency, actually it's UK expertise that has made a significant contribution to the high standards yeah. of aviation safety that we have in Europe and we would in, intend to maintain um, consistently high standards. So, of course, we will look at the question of our continued participation in, in uh, EASA, but that, as I say, will be a matter for the negotiations. Uh, the reason I said I wanted to differentiate between the agencies you cited is because Euratom is a different mm -hmm. case because of the very unique um, legal relationship in relation to uh, Euratom. Um, and that's why when we formally notified of our intention to leave the EU, we started the process for leaving Euratom because they do share a common institutional framework, which makes them, as I say, uniquely legally joined. Um, but what we are doing, as you know, we've been putting a nuclear safeguards bill through, in the, uh, uh, which has started in the House of Lords. Um, the, uh, we've agreed principles for addressing the key separation issues relating to our withdrawal from Euratom. That includes safeguards, future regime, principles of ownership for most special fissile material. And we're going to continue to apply international standards on nuclear safety as agreed by the International Atomic Energy Authority. So it's a good example of where we will be leaving a particular institution but continuing to operate on a basis that enables people to have, continue to have confidence in what the UK is doing and continue to work with us and, and uh, move material between us. Thank you. We'll come on to Angus Brendan. Thank you very much, um, Prime Minister, it's, it's a year, I think, since you're last at the Liaison Committee, and in that year you triggered the election last March. Um, sorry, you triggered Article 50 last March. When you triggered the Article 50 last March, did you plan to hold a general election or call a general election a month later? No. As I made clear at the uh, time that I called the general election, um, having seen the, uh, some of the response to uh, uh, the issues around Brexit, I felt it was appropriate to, uh, to call that general election. But at election the point of the Article the 50 being uh, called the end of March, were you planning to hold a general election at that point? knowing you had two years to go before the United Kingdom would leave the European Union. You had a lot of work to do in, that, in those two years. Yes, of course there was a lot of work to do in those did two years. Did you plan years. to hold the election? And I was, I, when, I, when I did call the general election, I was aware of the uh, fact that we were, had work to do in relation to the Brexit negotiations. Um, the, uh, and as you know, because I've said it, I, I made the final decision on the general election um, at uh, a, a time, it was over that Easter time, just before we came into, uh, back into, uh, into Parliament. Having uh, triggered Article 50, having called the election, uh, did you then imagine you'd go back six months later and beg the European Union for two more years in the Florence speech? Uh, I haven't begged the European Union for two more years. Uh, if you look at what I said in the Lancaster House speech, you will see that we were already talking about the concept of a smooth and orderly uh, process of withdrawing from the European Union. That is what the implementation period <coughs> is about. This is not two more years to negotiate with the European Union. This is about two years when practically both businesses and governments will be able to put in place the changes necessary to move from the current relationship to the future partnership but, that we will but have. But the reality is the two years that were triggered in March 2017 was not long enough. And in that period you also held an election and now you want this two-year period to go on longer. Was it wise to hold an election in, in that time when you knew that time would be so short? Or did you not realise time would be so short? No, I'm, I'm sorry because I, I don't um, accept the comments you're making about the timing in relation to the implementation period. This is not, <coughs> not suddenly said um, because there was a general election this year we need an extra two years on the other end of this negotiation. 
We've been very clear all along that we needed, there would be, a, in order to have a smooth and orderly Brexit, in order to have that smooth and orderly leaving of the European Union, we would want to ensure that businesses and governments were able to adjust to the future partnership. That is the purpose of the implementation period. That implementation period was always going to be after the point at which we've left the European Union, which having triggered in March of this year, um, that was going to, is going to be the end of March, 29th of March 2019. I think people will draw their own conclusions. Uh, Prime Minister, on trade deals, um, how many countries will the UK have increased trade barriers with uh, after Brexit? Well, after uh, Brexit, we will be in a position, we're looking to ensure that we're able not only to uh, have new trade deals with countries around the world, but also there are obviously a number of uh, trade arrangements which are currently held with the European Union and we'll be, we'll be looking at our relationship with those countries once we leave, uh, the, once we leave the EU and are no longer uh, subject to those arrangements. We will have increased trade barriers with the EU27, that's definite. Sorry, uh, will, I didn't catch your We question. will have increased trade barriers and tariffs with the EU27. We have a further 40 agreements so, covering I'm another 47, 67 countries. Sorry. So the UK is heading for a situation very possibly where we'll have increased trade barriers with up to 94 countries. How do you feel about that, Prime Minister? Well, I don't accept the premise of your question, I'm afraid. So we're, we're uh, the, premise of your question, the premise of your question is based on uh, us not being able, first of all, to negotiate a trade deal with the European Union and an expectation that there were bound to be increased trade barriers as a result well, of any negotiations that we have. I don't the, accept the premise the, the, the of that premise premise of the question. The premise of the question is based on the reality that you can have zero at the zero increase, which would maintain what we have at the moment, or we can go up to as many as 94. My original question in this area was how many countries from between zero and 94 will the UK have increased trade barriers with? No, and I, I have, uh, as I have made clear, there will be, when we have left the European Union, we will be looking to have trade deals in place. Obviously, there's a question of what we can do during the implementation period, but we intend to have trade deals in place with countries around the world with which, uh, in some cases, uh, the European Union may not currently have uh, trade deals with those countries. There will be countries where the European Union does have trade deals, and we will be looking at the relationship the United Kingdom will have with those countries post-Brexit as a result of no longer being part of those EU trade deals. And we've Just already, dis we've already, sorry, we've already started discussions with a number of those countries I'm aware of that, but as but to but how but we but can just ensure. Just here, Prime Minister. Uh, do you accept the premise that it's possible for the UK to have increased trade barriers with up to, up to 94 countries? Do you accept that possibility? No, what I'm saying is that what we, no, what we will be doing is the, the, premise, the, premise of your, is the premise of your question. The premise of your question, if I may, is that the United Kingdom is not going to be able to negotiate trade deal either with the European Union or with any of those countries with whom we currently have a trade deal as a member of the European Union. Now, one possibility is that, of course, we could roll over those arrangements with those countries as an, as an individual country after we leave the European Union. We have already started discussions with a number of countries as to what our future relationship with them will be. Because our aim is to ensure not that we see new trade barriers being put in place for the United Kingdom, but that actually we see improved trade relationships with countries around the world. Final question. Uh, there are political prisoners at the moment in the European Union, in Spain. Uh, do you have any particular view on that, Prime Minister? Sorry, I didn't... Do there you are pol political prisoners in Spain at the moment. Do you have any view on political prisoners currently in the European Union in 2017? Is your government well, have a view? I, I don't recognise... I, I assume that you are making a reference to the fact that the Spanish government I has uh, ensured that the Spanish constitution is abided with and that the rule of law, is, that people abide by the rule of law in Spain. And, that is, and we support the Spanish government in believing that, that the Spanish constitution should be applied so and the rule of law should be applied. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to come on to a group of questions now about Northern Ireland foreign affairs and home <coughs> affairs, starting with Andrew Murison. Good like a long way away down there. <laughs> yeah. You've had a really tough day. I'm, I'm, uh, my apologies, we're making it a lot worse for you. Congratulations on bringing us to where we are at the moment. Um, can, I, um, can I ask you, who is going to pay for the rights of Northern Ireland residents who identify themselves as being Irish and therefore will continue uh, with the possibility of an EU passport <coughs> after Brexit? Um, things like, for example, the European Health Insurance Card, and probably more importantly, uh, other further rights that the European Union may grant in the future. Uh, there are three possible uh, uh, 
pays for this, of course. There's the United Kingdom, there's the Republic of Ireland, uh, and there's the European Union itself. Which one of those will pay for those rights? Well, the question of the... Sorry, I was just checking the uh, references, because the question of things like um, the healthcare rights were actually uh, covered in the joint progress report that was published between the United Kingdom and the European Union. This has been exactly one of the issues that has been under, under discussion between the, uh, in order to ensure citizens' rights in the future and making sure that those, those um, arrangements could, uh, could continue as they do at present. Well, clearly, but there may be rights that the European <coughs> Union decides uh, to award its citizens in the future, and very often uh, rights do have a price tag. Uh, and whilst the rights are a good thing, clearly we have to consider uh, who is going to pay for them. So in the future, were the European Union to award rights, and given that we have accepted that those identifying as Irish will continue as European Union citizens, they're resident in, in, the, in Northern Ireland, uh, it would be useful to know uh, who would actually be responsible for paying for any, for any consequentials. Well, the, the, I'm sorry, I've just been shown, uh, the reference in the Joint Progress Report, which I was looking for, it specific, specifies in the European Health Insurance Card Scheme um, that uh, persons whose competent state, whose competent state is, the, is the UK and are in the EU 27 on the specified date and vice versa, whether on a temporary stay or resident, continue to be eligible for healthcare reimbursement including under the HIC scheme, as long as that stay residence or treatment um, continues. And that will, and that, obviously, that's an agreement that is going to take place in yes. the future, and so we will continue to be able to, to, yes. uh, to and, do that. And Prime Minister, that would hold for any other further rights that the European Union might wish to award within health care or elsewhere? Well, not, no, that, that is specific about the current arrangements that residents have within the European Union and therefore the, it, it, because that uh, citizen's rights element of this is about ensuring that the choices people have already made will continue to be respected in the future and it's in that context that that is, that that is set. Okay, all right, thank you. So any further rights that the European Union may dis determine would uh, be paid for by who? Well, the, uh, as it also says in the Joint Progress Report specifically in relation to Northern Ireland, both parties agree that the withdrawal agreement should respect and be without prejudice to the rights, opportunities and identity that come with European citizen, union citizenship for such people, that is the people of Northern Ireland who are Irish citizens and will continue to enjoy rights as EU citizens, and in the next phase of negotiations will examine arrangements required to give effect to the ongoing exercise of and access to those rights. Well, thank you. Uh, can I press you on paragraph 49 of the joint report? and the constructive ambiguity contained therein. Uh, the default position is obviously option three, which you have cited. Uh, and I'm puzzling over some of the words because uh, it mentions um, the whole island, whole island economy, the all-island economy, now and in the future in relation uh, to the rules of the internal market and the customs union, uh, which may be subject uh, to full alignment. Um, now, given uh, that the all-island economy now or in the future uh, means practically everything, all sectors, all industries, all products. I'm wondering where the divergence uh, may emerge in order to continue to provide our right honourable friend, the member for North Somerset, with a job. The, um, if I can just, I, I'm afraid I will repeat the point that I made in response to the very first set of questions that I was given. Um, this is not the default position in the sense it's the default default position. Um, uh, because there are two phases that we will be going through and I fully expect that we will be able to resolve the issue about the border in Northern Ireland uh, in the first uh, element of negotiations, I through the overall EU-UK relationship. There's a second stage we can go to if we fail that. This is then the, uh, the, the, the uh, final, as I say, the uh, default default rather than being the, the automatic stage that we go to if we don't manage to achieve this through the EU but UK Minister, relationship. I have to press you on the this because this, we, have to, we have to look at the worst possible option and option three is clearly the worst option. Well and uh, you will uh, I'm sure excuse me if I uh, say that I do sometimes hope that people would look at the best possible option as well as only ever looking at the worst possible option um, as you have described it. 
This is, this is to give the guarantee that we will ensure that there is no hard border in Northern Ireland. The all-Ireland economy already is there in a, in a number of ways. I, I cited some of the examples in relation to the first question that I was asked. Um, but if you go on to read in paragraph 50, it's clear that we will also ensure that we do this, don't do this in a way that disrupts or damages the economic integrity of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, as it says, no new regulatory barriers develop between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK unless actually consistent with the Belfast Agreement, the Northern Ireland exec Executive and Assembly have agreed that. Where do you think we can diverge? We must, we must be able to diverge, and um, at the moment that option three suggests that we simply will not diverge at all. Okay. What, what option three is saying is that if we get to that point, we will ensure that it is possible for trade to continue across uh, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland uh, without having a hard border and without having uh, that physical infrastructure at the border. That is the commitment that has been given. It's a commitment that we believe, because we've already put some forward some proposals on this, can be achieved as part of the wider relationship between the UK and the European Union. We will now be able to discuss that, to negotiate that in detail with all the parties concerned. We haven't been able to do that up until now because we've been in phase one of the negotiations. Now we've got sufficient progress and move into phase two. We'll be able to look at this in detail with the other parties. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. Prime Minister, thank you for coming this afternoon. Uh, what does Global Britain mean to you? Uh, Global Britain means a, a United Kingdom that is playing a full, like a full role on the world stage. It has various elements to it. Part of it is the trading relationships that we want to develop around the world. Another part is us continuing to play our role um, in, uh, in multilateral institutions around the world, so continuing to play our role in the United Nations, playing our role in NATO, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, commitments on defence and security that we give. Um, and uh, being an upholder of the values uh, that underpin our society and democracy here in the United Kingdom. Uh, your National Security Advisor specifically cited uh, only the other day to the Joint Committee on National Security Strategy the three elements are investing in partnerships, strengthening the rules-based system and boosting prestige. Today, with the reports that uh, so many of Her Majesty's ships are alongside, the boosting prestige does seem to be rather in concern. Well, I, I would... So just look at what we're doing around the world and what our armed forces are doing around the world. Um, you know, our Royal Navy is in the Mediterranean continuing to save lives in the Mediterranean and we've committed, as I did at the EU Council last week, to continuing to be in the Mediterranean as long as is necessary. Um, our uh, Air Force and the work that's been doing in the coalition in, uh, it, that we've been doing in the coalition in Iraq uh, and, and Syria, for example. And just last week at the Sun Military Awards, I was pleased to present an award to Operation Rumen, representatives of Operation Rumen, which was the Joint Services Award, of course, um, led by the Navy, uh, which went in and, and gave support to our overseas territories and others uh, after the hurricanes in the Caribbean. I think people see a united kingdom around the world that is playing its role. Of course, commitments we've made on defence are an important part of this, so also our, our commitment to maintain the 0.7% of GNI being spent on um, uh, aid. Uh, I think that shows a United Kingdom with commitments around the world. And what do you see us doing to increase the rules-based system? I think that is something that we are we're doing in a number of ways. I think part of that is about working with those countries, uh, working to encourage, persuade those countries who currently take action which are against the rules-based system um, to uh, sign up to an international order, which is that rules-based system. I think it's about the contributions we make in a number of international bodies to uphold the rules-based system, be that, as I said, within the United Nations or indeed another, in other bodies that we're party of. May I ask which nations might be your priorities and when are you going to publish or get the relevant departments, perhaps, rather, to publish your priorities on exactly these areas? Well, in terms of the um, uh, overall response that we have as the United Kingdom and global Britain, um, of course, we have uh, priorities in a uh, number of parts around the world, and in, but in uh, different ways around uh, various parts of the world. And may I switch to uh, Europe, if I may? Um, you cited, of course, the deep and special partnership that I know many of us hope for. 
Um, may I ask, you've spoken a little bit, or rather the government has spoken a little bit about the relationship with CFSP and CSDP. Could you uh, highlight how you see us playing our role in those two organisations or whether we have a role in those two organisations? Well, I think, if, if I may, I would, I would describe it in a slightly different way. I think what we want to continue to do as part of the Deep and Special Partnership is, of course, continue to be able to, con uh, to be discussing with and contributing to these issues of foreign policy and defence. We've said we're unconditionally committed to maintaining European security. Uh, we will do that. Obviously, we play a key role in NATO in, uh, in doing that, um, but would also look to uh, uh, the possibility of being involved in some um, uh, agreements that, that take place in Europe. I mean, PESCO, for example, which was uh, launched on uh, the European Council last week, we are not party to that, but there is a possibility uh, for, on particular operations, for other countries to be involved in that. Um, on, and on the foreign policy side, I think this is, uh, we would want to continue to be able to work with uh, the countries in the European Union 27 on key issues that are of uh, importance to us. One of the areas, for example, that the UK has been very clear, as I said in my statement on Monday that we've uh, led on, is the need for sanctions in relation to Russia. Uh, and the, so there are issues like that where we would want to be continuing to work with others to ensure that uh, we're upholding the values that we continue to share as Europeans. And you rightly highlighted our structured cooperation through organisations like NATO as part of guaranteeing our security and European security. <laughs> Would you agree that we require structured cooperation in terms of uh, alongside the EU in order to make sure that our sanctions regimes are as effective as they should be? Well, of course, one of the, one of the things that we will be doing in, uh, as we look at uh, um, legislation in relation to the position that will apply to the United Kingdom once we come out of the European Union is obviously to make sure it precisely to put forward uh, legislation to ensure we have, are able to uh, apply sanctions. But that's our own sanctions. sanctions. I meant being structured a, alongside others. Yes, but, but the, the point I'm making is that if we're not in the European Union, we won't necessarily be uh, party of that regime, but we will be putting in place a regime that would enable us to ensure that we are putting sanctions in place where we agree that it's appropriate to do so. Just as, I mean, today we obviously put, uh, put sanctions in place, not just that are applied by the European Union, but also United Nations sanctions. Thank you. Yvette. Afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, ideally, do you want us to stay full members of Europol and the European Arrest Warrant after Brexit? Well, we've had debates across the floor of the House, uh, you and I, in the past about Europol and the European Arrest Warrant. And obviously I argued with our JHA opt-out that we should remain part of Europol and the European Arrest Warrant. I think there are uh, benefits in both of these. Um, this will have to be part of the negotiations in future. Uh, and whether we're, we remain will be part of the, uh, uh, depend on the um, offer and the, uh, what we're able to negotiate in these. Just in terms of our objectives, in an ideal world, is that something we were aiming for, to keep the full membership of both? Well, I've, I've spoken about the value of Europol and the European Arrest Warrant. There are a number of programmes on the criminal justice and security side in Europe that I think we should look at as... as uh, where there are benefits not just to the UK from being a member, but benefits to the rest of the European Union for us being a member. And I would say some of those are around exchange of data at borders, for example. And, uh, so uh, but, but the reason I, I uh, answered initially as I did is that, of course, it will depend on the basis on which uh, the European Union, if we, as we negotiate our new security relationship, the basis on which they would be, uh, it would be possible for us to be members of I those. think what, what would be very helpful is to know whether it still is our best objective, even if I accept it is subject to the negotiations, and it's disappointing if you're not able to be clear on that. The second thing I want just quick clarification on is, at the border, I know that at Dover they are looking at um, uh, number plate recognition cameras and other ways of doing checks. Um, are you clear that that is not something that would be uh, an option in Northern Ireland because you said there'll be no physical infrastructure? Can you confirm you won't uh, look at cameras in the Northern Ireland border? We've said there will be no physical infrastructure in relation to Northern Ireland. We've put forward a number of uh, options as to how we think that that border <coughs> issue can be addressed. And in fact, those are options that could be more uh, applicable more widely in terms of our future relationship between the uh, Northern, um, uh, UK and the European Union. Uh, and if I may, just uh, there will be areas where, as I've, I've said right at the very beginning of this process, 
We're not going to give a running commentary on every detail of our negotiations. Of course, but so we're not we're not we're not going to give a running commentary on every aspect as we go into negotiations but, on these matters. But our, our we will be physical infrastructure. We we will be discussing how we address these issues. We have said that there will be no physical infrastructure at the border, no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So people will be able to move across that border as they do currently. <coughs> that cameras is have the to be physical. Presumably, they're not virtual. They have to be physical. Are you ruling out cameras at the Northern Ireland border? What I am saying is that as part of our negotiations, we will be ensuring that there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Okay. How we, that can be achieved in a number of ways. And I am not going to sit here at the moment and say precisely physical. how we are going to achieve that, because we are going into a negotiation. OK, that's also baffling. Um, on the process, now that Am Amendment 7 is in, can you confirm that there will be a vote on a statute before the withdrawal treaty uh, is ratified? What we're talking about in terms of the process on the <laughs> withdrawal uh, treaty is that there will be a, a vote in Parliament, which we've always said will be a meaningful vote on the um, uh, withdrawal agreement, which would take place, we would expect it to be able to take place before the European Parliament has had their vote. There would then be a subsequent process that Parliament will go through in putting the withdrawal agreement and implementation bill through Parliament. So that is what would put the withdrawal agreement into the legal uh, uh, status here in the United Kingdom. Sure, but now that Amendment 7 has been passed by Parliament, uh, can you confirm that that means there will now be a vote on a statute on the withdrawal agreement before the withdrawal agreement is ratified? Well, it, I'm slightly, it depends what you're talking about in terms of before the... the, the with, there before has to be a process. To we have to have an agreement. Process. We have to have a withdrawal agreement... Um, before we can bring a withdrawal agreement bill into Parliament for Parliament to agree that withdrawal agreement of bill. Course. There will be an opportunity for Parliament to vote on that withdrawal agreement on before, before that uh, legislation is brought into place. But will, will there be a vote on a statute before we legally, before Britain goes through the legal ratification process to ratify the withdrawal agreement treaty as part of the Article 50 process, can you confirm there will be a vote on primary legislation in this Parliament? The Parliament will have a vote on primary legislation, not simply on a motion. Well, Parliament will have two options, uh, opportunities to vote on this issue. The first will be a vote on the withdrawal agreement and whether or not Parliament agrees that withdrawal agreement. Then there will be primary legislation to bring that withdrawal agreement into UK law. And will that primary legislation happen before... Britain goes through the ratification process for the treaty? Well, it will, we will have had to have, uh, Parliament will have an opportunity to say whether or not it agrees with the treaty that we have agreed with the European Union. Um, there will then be a process of bringing that agreed treaty into UK law. But I'm still trying to get you to, to tell us the form of Parliament's vote. Will Parliament now get to vote on a statute? rather than a motion before the deal is finalised with Europe? Parliament will have an opportunity to vote on the deal before it is finalised. That's on a motion. But you're, you keep talking about a motion. But, but that, the is, of article, that is a vote. The consequence of Amendment 7 was to propose it being done on a statute. What's your objection to it being done on a statute rather than a motion, given that the government has ignored motions, for example, the October motion on universal credit, and has a history of doing so? Can you confirm you would have the vote on a statute before the process is finalised rather than on a motion, because that's what Amendment 7 says? Well, we will, of course, be looking at Amendment 7, but I think what the, 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 the principle of what we want to do is to ensure that Parliament is able to have what we have always said would be a meaningful vote, um, before, as I say, before the European Parliament has its vote and before we then bring that agreement into uh, the legislation in the, here in the United Kingdom. But the, the, the bit that ensures that that withdrawal agreement is in UK law will be the EU withdrawal agreement and implementation bill. And will that happen before the treaty is ratified? Yes or no? Well, it, it depends what you're talking about by formal ratification of the treaty, because there were various, there were various process. processes in this. Before, we, will, we have to 
We can't bring a withdrawal agreement bill before the House unless we've got an agreement, a withdrawal agreement. So that, I mean, that's just, no, you know, so you have, is no, you have to have, no vote on we have to have, have no but Parliament will have voted on that withdrawal agreement. Parliament will have had its say. Parliament will have said whether or not it agrees with that withdrawal agreement. Thank you. We come to the final group on, on Brexit questions. Um, I'm starting with Sir William Cash. Uh, um, on the current withdrawal bill, uh, I wrote to you yesterday as chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee regarding the disapplication of primary legislation under this bill. This will be the first time in British constitutional history that the courts would be empowered to strike down acts of parliament under domestic legislation. Of course, as we know from the Factotain case and the striking down by the House of Lords of the Merchant Shipping Act 1988, this has been possible where an Act of Parliament is inconsistent with Sections 2 and 3 of the current European Community Act 1972 and the case law of the European Court of Justice, such as the Costa case. However, on our leaving the EU and the repeal of that Act, completely different considerations apply. I raised this issue during the withdrawal bill proceedings on the 21st of November and I've referred the matter to several Secretaries of State and the Attorney General, as well as to yourself now. Fears have also been expressed, for example, by Lord Newberger, the former President of the Supreme Court, that the courts could be dragged into the political arena and there are those who would seek direction to the courts uh, to be clearly included in this bill. The question of uh, how it would be done derives from Clause 5 and 6 of the Bill. So I trust that you would agree that this is a matter of such constitutional importance and novelty that uncertainty must be removed and that clear direction must be given to the courts to deal with this matter by government at the report stage on 16th and 17th of January. The issue is not confined to retained EU law, but also to pre-exit enactments. So to avoid any constitutional crisis or clash between Parliament and the courts, and to reaffirm the sovereignty of Parliament, it would be possible to amend the bill to introduce a clear express statutory provision giving clear direction to the courts on these issues, for example, by drawing on the concept of incompatibility as we have with the current and existing EU Human Rights Act 1998. So my question is, what are your own thoughts on this, given the constitutional novelty and the extreme constitutional implications of it all? And would you, following further interdepartmental discussion, in principle, agree to resolve this matter by amendment on the report stage? Well, I will obviously... I, I... Uh, will be responding to your letter um, uh, in full and will do so in a, a timely fashion. Um, I, one of the issues, that, and I was just looking at the references in the Joint Progress Report, one of the issues that we have been obviously discussing in part one of the negotiations is how we ensure that citizens' rights can, we, we, that, that the European Union can feel that we have given sufficient guarantee about EU citizens' rights here in the UK for the future. <laughs> and that is why um, we have been very clear about the relationship of the rights being brought into the withdrawal agreement and whether or not those rights, the extent to which those rights could be um, changed in future. Uh, and that is, I think, where what lies at the heart of the issue uh, that you have raised in relation to the ability of the courts to say that particular legislation takes, takes primacy over, over other legislation. It's to ensure that consistency of, uh, of interpretation, but also to ensure <coughs> that consistency of um, approach in relation to EU citizens' rights in the future. But That's to will, give people you reassurance. Will, you will look at this very carefully, won't you? I'm sure. You I will. Know. I will. Don't, don't worry. I will. Res I will look very carefully at it and respond to your letter you. in full. Well, I just very quickly also like to refer to the European Commission recommendations for a council decision and annex <coughs> on the second phase of negotiations, which uh, uh, the uh, European Co European Commission issued today. It reads very much like an ultimatum. 
Uh, I read it very carefully. And I, may I urge you to be very robust in your response and language? Because in the big picture, given the voters last year voted to leave the European Union, they would do so even more emphatically now if they were to have taken on board the very specific of arrangements and proposals that are being put forward by the likes of President Juncker, uh, by President Macron, by Schultz, and so on and so forth, that for ever deeper European integration, <coughs> if the British voters voted as they did last time, and they now had to confront the questions that are now being put to them about this extraordinary centralization and deeper integration that's in prospect, don't you agree that they would actually leave on an even bigger scale than they did then? Well, I think the important, the important thing for the British people is that they, will, they are leaving, we are leaving, and of course it will then be up to the EU27 where they take the European <coughs> Union in future. And as you say, there have been a number of um, contributions to that debate made by President Juncker, President Macron and others uh, in recent months. But that will be a matter for the EU27. We will be out of uh, that and not part of, uh, of that. And in response to the comments that you made about the um, guidelines that have been issued, the draft guidelines that have been issued by the Commission today on phase two of the negotiations, of course, these are the starting point of negotiations. And I can assure you that we will be robust <coughs> in our defence of the United Kingdom's interests. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, finally, Bernard, on this section. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, as you know, uh, the Public Administration and Constitution Committee is looking at how to help the civil service become more effective as it faces the challenges of Brexit. Can I ask to start with how confident uh, you can be uh, that the coordination and leadership of DEX-EU across the whole of government to get government ready for day one of Brexit, that, this, um, that these edicts and directions are being effective? Well, I think that there are, I would say there are a number of... Uh, ways in which we can assure that, in, ensure that that is uh, taking place. Obviously, we've created a, a significant number of new roles within government to look at uh, in dealing with Brexit and all the ramifications of, uh, of Brexit. I mean, the, the key issue in terms of ensuring that individual departments are operating and doing what they need to do is the direction that comes from uh, not just the Permanent Secretary, but also Secretary of State secretaries of state within that and that is brought together in the committee structure that we have within government to, um, to provide for that opportunity for discussion but also agreement which is then translated to departments um, but we do monitor and do constantly look and uh, ask the question as to what is happening and to make sure that the departments are providing what they need to provide and are doing the work that they need to do. Um, indeed, and there are um, 313 Gantt charts, um, one for each of the work streams across government, charting the programs, progress and the risks to each program. As Sir Philip Rycroft, Philip Rycroft the DEXU perm said, <coughs> says that only some 20 programs are what he describes as moving too slowly. But how can we be confident that these um, thumbnail assessments are reliable, giving reliable information about the progress of these programmes? Well, I think that's a, a, a process that we go through in terms of um, <coughs> challenge that comes from the civil service to uh, two departments to ensure that then obviously the, uh, the Cabinet Office plays a, a role in this, as does DEXU, uh, and also, but also any concerns about departments and whether they are doing the job that they need to do is also um, from time to time brought to ministers and ministerial uh, encouragement and direction um, is how given. How do you respond to Sir Oliver Letwin's suggestion to PACAC last week uh, that uh, the organised effort across Whitehall actually requires uh, a dedicated, what he would describe, very senior cabinet minister who commands the confidence of the prime minister, you, in order to make sure that the writ of these programmes really runs right through the departments? Well, I would say that I think that it's... Uh, my own view is that we have a structure already which enables us to ensure that that, is, that, that writ is running through departments. Um, obviously, it's clear to people the role that DEXU has in this and the Secretary of State of DEXU has in, in setting... A lot, of this, uh, a lot of this in train. But the important, I think, ultimately the important thing for departments is that this is a cross-government activity which the Cabinet 
um, discusses, the Cabinet agrees, and that is a very clear message, not just for Secretaries of State, but for their departments. And what is the role of the first Secretary of State in this, in, in this cross-departmental cross coordination, which would normally fall more, fall more naturally to the Cabinet Office? Yes, and, the, and department? the first Secretary of State plays a role in um, a, a, across government issues in terms of, uh, of coordinating and ensuring coordination. Um, can I just ask very briefly about the, um, <coughs> um, the result of the amendment to the EU withdrawal of bill about the sifting committee? Um, how will the government treat decisions of the sifting committee um, when it recommends that uh, secondary legislation be subject to um, the approval of the House? Well, obviously, the, the, the purpose of the sifting committee is to give the opportunity to the House to um, not just reassure itself, but actually ensure that where it thinks a, a matters are uh, a, of such significance that they should be dealt with in a particular way, i.e. affirmative procedure rather than a negative procedure, that that is done. I mean, the government obviously will... Um, take account of, the, of what the sifting committee has proposed. We wouldn't be putting it in place if we weren't going to do that. Well, I'm very grateful for that assurance because I'm afraid history is littered with recommendations from statutory change committee and the European Scrutiny Committee where recommendations for debate on the floor of the House or in committee have been very much delayed or ignored. So I think it's very important. And, but, um, I was Sorry. going to say, I might remind you that I once wrote a pamphlet which said that there should Indeed. be more European debates on the floor of the House and more of the decisions from the Scrutiny Committee should come to the House. I wasn't going to be discourteous to throw that one at you, Prime Minister. Um, but for all affirmative instruments, whether designated affirmative under the Withdrawal Bill or recommended affirmative by the Sifting Committee, how will the Government schedule the business uh, to make sure that there is reasonable opportunity for relevant committees to comment on these points. <coughs> well, this is, this is not going to be um, uh, an easy task, um, particularly if the length of time that, um, which is available to government for, statutory, for dealing with these statutory instruments is, uh, is limited. Uh, and uh, so it will be, I'm afraid, uh, uh, Parliament will be very busy. Well, some, um, of our, there will be some of our honourable and right honourable friends have shown um, great enthusiasm for setting up very late to scrutinise many more orders and details of legislation than we might have had to if the bill hadn't been amended. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you, and thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on now to a very important <coughs> domestic agenda. I don't know whether you want to take a, take a few seconds to have a glass of water or anything. Prime change Minister, folders. Change and move, move on. And uh, we're going to start by talking about the NHS and social care. And just in starting that, would you recognise that there is a funding gap and that that's widening because of the scale of the increasing demand? And, and although the budget's increasing, that it's not keeping up with that uh, rising demand. Would you, would you recognise that? Well, I, I recognise that there are pressures in um, both on the health service and also on social care, um, predominantly on social care, of course, pressures from the ageing aging population. That also has an impact on the, on the health service. Um, and it's precisely, you know, it's in response to the pressures that we've seen that the government has put extra money into social care. We recognise and also did this in the, uh, in the autumn budget, We've put more money into the National Health Service over the next few years. I think there, is also, uh, there are also questions as to ensuring that we see health and social care operating uh, well together, where they need to operate uh, well together. Um, but we have put extra funding in. Indeed. But do you accept that uh, the, the concerns from NHS England, that, that when they meet to review the, the mandate to the NHS, that difficult choices will have to be made? Um, because of the, the funding gap? Well, as, as I've just said, we have put, ex, we've recognised yes, recognize that extra, extra funding is required and we yes. have put extra funding into the NHS and obviously into social care as well. Obviously the discussion on the NHS mandate is, uh, is taking place, um, but I, I, we have responded by ensuring in the autumn budget that extra funding is going into the NHS. Of course, I think what people want to see as well is, is to have the confidence that um, the money that goes into the NH, 
uh, into the NHS is spent as well as it can be. Of course, and productivity in the NHS is outstripping background productivity in the wider economy. That They've done extraordinarily well. Um, but there is a concern that there remains a gap, even though extra was put in in the budget. Um, could I just turn to the Select Committee on Long-Term Sustainability of the NHS um, from the House of Lords? Um, they commented that there was a culture of short-termism across the NHS and social care. We seem to, to limp from one crisis, plugging a gap to another. Would, would you accept that, and that we need to look to the long, take the longer view on um, both NHS and social care funding? Well, as you probably are aware, on social care, I've said that the response to the pressures that we see in social care system should be, if you like, of three types. There's the short-term response, which mm -hmm. is the extra money that has been put in, the two billion extra at the spring budget, uh, and the social care precept that uh, has been provided for, for councils to choose to uh, choose to apply. Uh, there's a medium-term need to respond, which I believe is about ensuring that best practice is shared, <laughs> and we see best practice being adopted across the system. I think we are seeing some impact on delayed discharges. Um, in relation to that, the, you know, the record is, is quite different. But there is indeed a long term, a, a need to ensure long term sustainability of the system. That's why government is doing work on this. It's why we will be bringing forward a green paper next year. And we will have wide discussions and consultation on this. And I think what um, I want to see and hope we'll be able to achieve is an agreement on a sustainable system of social care into the long term, which can continue to be supported, because that's the whole point of sustainability. Prime Minister, do you feel that you're risking missing a golden opportunity to bring both health and social care into that review? Well, I think if, if as I look at it, there are certainly overlaps in relation to health and social care. I think those are already being recognised mm -hmm. on the ground in a, a number of in a number of ways. The STPs, a number of the STPs, for example, are about <coughs> ensuring that better integration of health and social care. If you look at some of the examples around the country in Salford, where the hospitals trust is employing social workers, indeed, and there's these work, are yes, I accept. We all accept there's work going on. What I'm talking about is when we're talking about how we fund the system of the, as a whole, because as you'll know, when the House of Lords committee started off, their, their remit was to look at long-term sustainability of the NHS, but they very rapidly recognised that you couldn't see this in isolation, and so they renamed it the long-term sustainability of the NHS and adult social care. So say, everyone that looks at this comes eventually to the same conclusion, that we need to look at the financial sustainability of both the NHS and social care, and that's my concern. Well, but... I would say that there are, there, there are, of course, differences between the way we approach the NHS and the way we approach social care al yes. already in terms of the NHS being free at the point of, of use, for example. There are already being means testing in the social care system. <coughs> so there are different approaches to those two systems uh, uh, as we see them already. Um, I think what is important is that we ensure that in the overlap between the NHS and social care, we are seeing good integration. And for me, that's... A, crucially among this, this is actual, actually good integration on the ground where people are working together. Because this isn't, this isn't about um, you know, having lots of theories about this, it's actually about what people do on of the ground and how they, how they ensure that that is meshing together. There are many things on the ground, but when you're conducting your, when you're, you're um, preparing your green paper, would you consider thinking again and bringing in health within the scope of that green paper if your advisors um, tell you that they think that is necessary? Would you consider it? Well, work is already being done on the social care um, system and the uh, current expectation of that work and the current, uh, what that work is currently showing is that what we need to do in relation to that is to focus on the sustainability of the social care system, to recognise where there will be overlaps with the NHS, but to look at this uh, to look very much to focus specifically on the social care aspect of this to ensure that we can get that long-term sustainability. I think that's important. I, I think this isn't of just a, a sort of a large Whenever sort of I speak to audiences and I ask them whether or not they'd be prepared to pay more to ensure the long-term sustainability of our NHS, they agree that they would do so by a very large margin. Um, it's, it's more equivocal on social care, so bringing the two in together 
would, do you feel that you might find that there's greater acceptability to increasing the funding and how we're going to do that if you brought both health and social care within that green paper? I, I think, um, how can I put this? I think it is right that we uh, talk to people about the challenge that is there for social care. I think it's important that we do ensure that we have a focus on social care. And I wouldn't want to see that in, an, in some sense being subsumed in the discussion on the health service for the future and funding of the health service for the future. I think it's important that we are able to give a fo clear focus on the social care system. Thank you, Prime Minister. I'll come on to Norman Lamb. Good afternoon. Uh, the <coughs> concern of anyone who's looked at the long-term trends just sees the pressure growing inexorably on both the health system and the care system. Uh, and you, you may remember, I appreciate it's a long time ago and you've had quite a busy year, uh, but on the 1st of February, uh, you agreed to meet with a group of us across the political spectrum. We had a very good discussion uh, and you sanctioned a process of dialogue uh, starting. And we've had something of a dialogue, which I really welcome. But I just wonder, we, uh, after, in the run-up to the budget, we had, I think, 90 MPs <coughs> signing up to a letter to you. I don't think we've had a reply yet. Uh, uh, again, pressing you to agree to a cross-party process to confront these long-term and growing challenges. How can we convince you uh, that this is really necessary? Um, I apologise if you had, that was the letter of the 18th of November, yeah. I assume. Well, I apologise if you haven't I'm, had I'm a not complaining. response I realize, to, realize that, you've been busy. to that letter. And we want to continue, and we do want to continue the dialogue in relation to um, social care, because as I said earlier... But in uh, just to interrupt there quickly, we're talking about health and social care because there is inevitably uh, a, a connection, an interrelation, and what you do in one side of the divide always has an effect on the other. Well, but the, there are... Undoubtedly, as we know, aspects of the social care system and the health service that do interact, that do have an implication for each other. Um, but also there's an awful lot that the health service does that isn't actually about the social care system or has an impact on the social care system. So I think it, it, that's why I think it's important. But, but do, you, do, do you agree that partisan politics, the politics as we normally conduct it, just isn't going to solve these long-term uh, pressures? Uh, you may have uh, felt that in the general election campaign where you tried to be quite audacious uh, with a social care plan uh, and got slaughtered as a result of it in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the, the political response. Doesn't that just show that we need to be prepared to work together? There's a whole group of people across Parliament who are committed to helping find a solution. That seems to me to be quite a big offer. Well, and, and I would hope, and as I said, we'll be publishing a green paper, I would intend and hope that there could be very good um, cross-party discussions uh, uh, in response to that green paper, because this is not, uh, if we're talking about the long-term sustainability of our social care system, and the this health isn't system. some... Well, and the health system. Th th this, I, I know you want us to be publishing a green paper that is on both. Mm. Uh, we'll be publishing a green yeah. paper on the social yeah. care system. It's about long-term sustainability of that system, and that... Um, means not sustainability just to the end of one particular parliament or under one particular government. It actually needs to be something that's going to be genuinely sustainable into the future, the reason, something on which we can agree on. The, the, the reason why I keep mentioning the NHS is that the pressures are intense there. Uh, just uh, in the uh, NHS England's board minutes from, or board papers from the end of November, they pointed out that NHS constitution rights, patient rights under the constitution, will not be met this year. We're not meeting the uh, waiting time standards on uh, A&E, on cancer, which is a, a matters of life and death, and on waiting for uh, operations. And 900 people in July were put into out-of-area beds in the mental health system. This is intolerable, isn't it? And don't we have to be prepared to work together to find solutions to this? Well, and, uh, and there have been improvements. If we look at A&E, I think it's something like 1,800 people more each day are now seen within the, uh, within the standard. Uh, we have the highest level of cancer survival rates. Do we want to do better and do more? Of course we do. And I, uh, I accept that, uh, that we do want to be able to continue to improve the service that is, that is being provided. And yes, you know, this, this is uh, a question. We're all committed to the principles that underpin our National Health Service and ensuring that that is able to provide for the future. Just, just I think we have a very... Sorry, if I may. Mm. I, I, I think one of the issues we have is 
There has, if I may say so, been a lot of focus on the NHS over time. There's probably been slightly less focus on the social care system. I and I think this is a part that we need to ensure we focus on and do provide that long-term s- just, sustainability for. Just the final point I'd make to you is it seems to me that in a way you have a choice uh, in your period in, in government now. You can either preside over the slow and steady decline of the NHS and the care system because of the pressures we all see. Or you could actually go down in history as the Prime Minister who confronts these big issues, who works with other parties and is, uh, comes up with solutions that can achieve a sustainable solution. Isn't that attractive to you? Well, I, I, I have to, I'm tempted to say I'm always suspicious about people who say if you only do, do this, you'll go down in history. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are various ways of going down in history, I have to say. It's a marvellous birthday present for the NHS on its 70th birthday, I think, though. Um, Clive Betts, next. The very support efforts to get a cross-party agreement for long-term sustainable uh, arrangements to fund social care. But there is a here and now. Um, any long-term changes are probably going to take several years to come in. How confident are you that every elderly person, every person with disabilities who needs social care, is going to get it next year? Well, we have made provision... Um, which we believe will ensure that councils and, and uh, bodies that are responsible for this are able to, are able to provide uh, for people. What I think is important is that as we look at this, it's not just about the funding for that care that is provided for individuals, it's also about how that care is provided at local levels um, and uh, ensuring the quality of that care at, at, at local levels. Yes, but funding is it's quite a, it's a, funding a, is quite important, isn't it, Prime Minister? And even after the money that was put in in the spring budget, which was welcomed and it came after um, the CLG Select Committee report asking for extra funding, even after that money was put in, the local government association, cross party with the Conservative majority currently, and the King's Fund independently, both said that there is a two billion pound shortfall next year in the funding for social care yet no money in the budget to deal with that. Well, uh, we did, as you know, provide budget money in the budget in the spring budget. Yeah, but to, even after uh, that, provide the £2 billion for social, shortfall. To provide for social care. Um, we have given local authorities the opportunity in relation to the social care precept. I think there is work that needs to be done and remains to be done in terms of ensuring best practice across right. all parts of the, uh, of the system. Um, because the, the performance across parts of the system does vary significantly in, on, right. in relation to certain aspects. I mean, Care Quality Commission now rates 80% of social care settings as good or outstanding. So right. that's good, but of course we want to ensure that right. people are all getting the quality of care so that they need. The, the million plus people that Age UK say aren't receiving the social care they need, it's all down to council's failures rather than lack of money, is it? I, we have made provision in terms of uh, extra funding that has gone into social care, but there is, I recognise there are pressures on social care. I understand what you say about the long term, but there is a need for us to approach this. This is, this is about putting extra money in in the short term, ensuring best practice, but also that work for the long term sustainability, Absolutely. precisely because of those but, pressures but that are under the... Uh, the King's uh, Fund independently are saying a £2 billion shortfall, but you seem to be saying there's enough money in there and these figures are wrong. Well, councils have had access to nine and a quarter billion pounds more dedicated funding for OSHA. That they will have that for adult social care over the next yeah. three years. That's the possibility of the social care preset together with the yes. improved better care yeah. fund. Yeah. Uh, of course, including the two billion additional yeah. funding that was put in. Yes. So extra money is being put yeah. in to um, uh, social but care. Even after that money, and last year, just over yes. half of councils actually increased spending in real terms on social care. Yeah. But, but you accept that, the, that in real terms, funding's actually reduced since 2010, but demand in terms of more elderly people needing such care has actually gone up. Well, you accept that? I recognise there are pressures in terms of the demand that has been put on the social care system. As I say, last year just over half of councils increased spending in real but terms. But you accept in real terms and, it's fallen it's, since 2010? Well, if I, if I say over half of councils are, have increased spending in real terms last year, that's a slightly different figure from the one that, uh, that you're so quoting. It's, it's a slightly different it's picture the from the one that you're quoting. But the, the, I think if you look, there are examples of councils that have shown that it is possible uh, to expand funding and provision, and that's, those are councils of different 
uh, under different political control in various parts of the in various parts of the country have shown what can be what can be done. So you're saying there's no funding problem at all to social care? I'm saying that we've recognised pressures that are on social care, and that's why we have put extra funding into social care. You don't accept the King's Fund's analysis, then? I've recognised that there are pressures on social care, and we have put extra funding into social care. Thank you. We're going to come on to education and Robert Halford. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you. Um, with the nomination of the Social Mobility Commissioners, uh, would it not be a good idea to reboot um, the Commission, put a Social Justice Commission at the heart of Downing Street with the best experts in the land and use that Commission to make sure it had teeth by making sure it uh, looked at every domestic policy for the impact on social justice? Well, I think the, uh, we have an opportunity to um, <coughs> refresh the Social Mobility Commission. I think what you're asking me is, will I turn it into something slightly slightly different and well, make well, it more wide-ranging. Because at the moment it's just a state think tank, um, which is very good and publishes worthy reports, but it has no teeth. Why not give it teeth and use it to really reboot social justice and why not put it at the heart of Downing Street um, and use it to stress test every domestic policy on, in terms of social justice? Well, I mean, the, looking at issues around social justice is one of the things that we do do already. Um, and we do, obviously, I was clear about the importance that I attached to this when I became Prime Minister. And we continue to address this in a number of, a number of different ways. Um, I, one can look at different governance structures. One can look at different ways to, to approach this. Ultimately, how we deal with these social justice issues will be down for how the decisions that government takes, the policies we introduce, the, the legislation we introduce where it's appropriate for legislation. Obviously, a lot of this won't be about legislation. Um, if you're saying, should we take the opportunity to, uh, as I say, refresh the Social Mobility Commission, I think that this does give us an opportunity uh, to do that. Um, and But the... Um, remit that we have in government, the, the, the uh, purpose that we have in government does go across all of the social, a uh, whole range of social justices, justice issues. Just one example of what we've done in that is the <coughs> racial disparity audit, for example. You know, pretty uncomfortable reading, but for the first time a government actually said, let's look at what's actually happening out there. So I would hope we've shown our commitment to this. Well, could, you said um, when you took office, we will do everything we can to help anybody, whatever your background, to go as far as your talents will take you. And if I can just bring you on to the subject of exclusions and alternative provision, um, you will know that uh, just 1.1% of pupils in alternative provision get five good GCSEs. 63% uh, of prisoners have been excluded, excluded. Now it's suggested that some schools are gaming the system to offload challenging students. And do you not agree that urgent action one is needed on alternative provision and exclusions, but also to make schools more accountable for the educational outcomes of the children that they exclude? Well, I think the uh, education department has been looking at this whole question of exclusions because you're absolutely right that there are some aspects of this that we should be concerned about. And as you, you cited yourself, the percentage of the prison population who have at some stage been excluded. And these are exactly the sort of issues we need to be looking at, but the Department of Education has been looking at the exclusion process um, and at how that can be improved so that we make sure that those pupils are, who are excluded are given appropriate education. But um, I'm sure the ideas that you've suggested will be uh, taken, looked at by the DfE. Thousands of children are being educated in alternative settings that are, not, not, that are unregistered and don't even fall within Ofsted's uh, remits and would you not say it's time to change it so that every educational establishment is properly scrutinised? Well I'm, I'm uh, because I don't have the figures in front of me I'm not sure what you're encompassing what you're covering when you talk about the alternative provision for education of course there are some children who are not in an educational establishment at such who will be homeschool um, tutored um, which is a, a, a different environment. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm including that. You're including yeah. that in that. Um, well, I think what I would say is what we want to do is to ensure that children get, a, get the appropriate education and get a good quality of education. And I think it is important that we see that because I, I think, uh, like, uh, like you, would say that actually getting a good quality of education is, is absolutely a fundamental in terms of improving social mobility and giving people, ensuring people are able to take, get the best opportunities in life. And very finally, Prime Minister, um, the 
manifesto said we will make the system easier for young people taking technical and vocational routes. We will introduce a UCAS style portal for technical education. And nothing appears to have been said or done on this since the election. Is this still the government's commitment to deliver this important change? Yes, uh, indeed, in the T skill, uh, T levels that we're introducing. Well, there's, there's various it's aspects. About the UCAS, specifically the UCAS for F, FE. Oh, sorry, the, the UCAS form for FE. In the manifesto, yeah. Um, yes, I, I'm. Uh, will have. I'm afraid I will have to take that away okay. and look at it specifically what we've done on the UCAS form. But it's certainly it's our intention to make the ability for young people to um, move into different types of, of education provision and to, to ensure that nobody is cut off from um, getting the opportunities and making the most of, of their talents and their skills. But I'll, if I may, I will look at the specific point that you've raised on the UCAS. Sorry, I misheard your question. Thank you. We come now to Frank Field. Prime Minister, for a long period of time now, governments have uh, increased in real terms the benefits of pensioners and have cut the benefits of people of working age. There's been a, a policy of quite massive application of standards um, and there's now reports of hardship in our constituencies turning into destitution. Might you consider um, an overall impact study of what the welfare reforms, as they're called, um, a sanctions policy has been to see where in fact there might be need now to raise relatively the benefit of families to those with, uh, who are pensioners? Well, the, 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 assess the cumulative impact of um, welfare reforms, tax and public spending changes on household incomes and, and the latest analysis of that was given in the uh, autumn budget, it accompanied the autumn budget in November. Obviously we want our welfare system to provide a safety net for those who need it. Uh, we're uh, spending over it's over £90 billion pounds a year on working age, working age benefits. I think in terms of the, um, how we best provide for people, I mean, of course, I continue to believe that the best route out of poverty is through work, and actually helping to get people into the workplace is a, an absolutely crucial part of, this, uh, part of this. But as I say, the overall impact of the welfare reform tax and public spending plans on household incomes is assessed and is, um, was... Uh, uh, published in accompaniment to the budget in, autumn, in November. As you've been mired in having to give most detailed replies, can I actually follow this up in correspondence with you? <coughs> Whether in fact, for the vulnerable tail end, our official data don't as effectively capture what's happening to them as maybe. Um, but as you say, the best route out of, out of poverty is work. Um, you initiated the Taylor Review to look at what was happening in the labour market and you've had a, re um, a joint report from Rachel's com the committee that Rachel chairs that, and that I have chaired. Given the importance the government has attached to in one respect giving us a national living wage which, below which no one should fall, the evidence by which employers are getting round this and the other areas where the, the committees made suggestions to you about where we need legislative change um, without um, trying to entice you, you'll be the most famous Prime Minister in the world. <laughs> this wouldn't be going down by in history by, again, by, would it, Frank? By, by following this recommendation, given that, you, you, that it is you that initiated this review, um, how serious and over what time scale are you going to seize the initiative back on this or might, as we suggested, Rachel and I, it's something that we might, with civil servants' guidance, do the bill for you? Well, certainly, and I appreciate the work that both your committees have put into this particular issue. I, of course I'm serious about the, the Taylor Review. I wouldn't have commissioned it if I didn't think there was an issue there that we needed to address as government, and we'll respond to the Taylor Review um, shortly. Uh, we did say in the budget that we will be consulting on employment status and looking at the case and the various options for longer term reform to make the employment status test for employment rights and tax clearer. Um, obviously, you'll appreciate this is a, that particular aspect is a, is a complex issue and I think it's right that we look at it in the round. Mm. But the, the point of commissioning Taylor was to say we have a changing employment market. Um, we need to ensure that the structures that we've got, that the rights that we have, 
and every aspect actually reflects that changing market. And so we're looking very seriously at the reports that, that the report that uh, Matthew Taylor produced, and obviously we'll look at the work that both of your committees did as well. Um, and uh, I note your offer to take the work away from the civil service, and or perhaps with the support of the civil service, do it service. yourselves. But we will we will obviously want to respond to. It the is clear report. from this broadcast, Prime Minister, how the huge amount of energy that you have to put into the Brexit negotiation, and I welcome the creation of this uh, Brexit cabinet and that you, in a sense, changing the whole tempo. There is a danger of you trying to do too much when other people want to help you. <laughs> and Rachel and I want to help you on this, obviously along lines that you accept, but you don't have to do everything, Prime Minister. We, as I say, we'll, we'll respond to the Taylor review. I, I have to say, I, I think, and I hope the female members of the committee will agree, that women are pretty good at multitasking. Yeah, yeah. There are limits even to good multitaskers. <laughs> I, I think that yes. uh, Frank raises an important point, and that all the energy of government is, is going into Brexit. And I think you have huge goodwill um, yes. around this table for joint working. We've heard from both CLG, Committee Science and Technologies and Health, from BASE and from Work and Pensions. Can I urge you again, Prime Minister, to really see the Liaison Committee and Select Committees as something that can really help you to get important domestic policy agendas across the line, particularly challenging when we have a hung parliament and Brexit. So I really hope that you'll, you'll take that opportunity. Well, I, I, re I recognise the work that the Select Committees do, and obviously this committee coming, bringing as it does the chair of the Select Committees together. Um, I would say that it is not the case that the whole of the energy of government is being put into Brexit. Um, obviously, this is uh, a, a very big task that the government is undertaking, um, and we are putting the right level of expertise, the right level of resource into doing it. But we are also uh, doing various other things as well, uh, uh, alongside you know, the changes we're making on technical education that have been referred to, the issues on social justice like the racial disparity audit, um, a whole variety of issues that are being addressed, the social mobility action plan, a whole variety of issues being addressed in other areas too. So it's not the case that the government is putting all its energy into Brexit. No, nobody doubts your skills with multitasking. Yeah, but, uh, the challenge we've got is the to the last war. Churchill didn't concern himself with the subjects we've now got at the end of our session with you, but he did make sure um, that they were catered for in different ways. And um, just for your, your health's sake, uh, I think it's just, as Sarah said, there's a real opportunity of governing differently while you get on with the main issue, which the country wants you to get on with, and which the poll show despite all the statements to the contrary in, in the Commons and so on, that they wish you to complete. Well, I'm, I mean, and I want to ensure that we complete the other, the other aspects as well as, 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 well as Brexit. Although I'm, I'm tempted yeah. to say I have been tempted by not just yourself but also another member of the committee to go down in history on domestic policy issues, no. which is rather than, the, uh, rather than the Brexit issue. I was joking about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, now we come now to Maria Miller. Prime Minister, the issue of sexual harassment in Hollywood and Westminster has been making the headlines, but the truth is that more than half of women in this country suffer sexual harassment, often in silence. What's your government doing to tackle that problem? Well, I think that there's a number of things that there are a number of things that government can do, but it's not just obviously about government. It's about attitudes um, and the uh, approach that people take in different environments to um, to this uh, to this particular issue. Government, I think, can help through um, the making clear through actions such as, um, if you like, that uh, one end of the the uh, issue of sexual abuse on violence against women and girls, where we act, what we do, um, and setting a very clear message in relation to that. I would hope that the work that is being done, that I initiated in bringing party leaders together and that the leader of the House of Commons has now taken up with the working group on looking at the issues of, of harassment and indeed um, other aspects, which not just about sexual harassment but bullying here in, in the workplace of, the, uh, of Parliament, also sends a signal to people. But this isn't going to be something that is uh, changed simply by government taking one action or another, um, because it is about the attitudes that people have within workplaces, within other environments. 
But do you think the government's violence against women strategy should actually directly address this? Because it's the most common form of abuse that women face, but it's not tackled within that strategy. Well, I think the, the, what I would say is that the um, violence against women strategy, I think, first of all, it was important that we focus on that aspect as uh, uh, and committed to that strategy and continue to put issues, uh, uh, policies in place that deliver on that. I think in terms of the wider issue of sexual harassment, it's, this is something which we can talk about, but if what we're able to do on the Ending Violence Against Women and Girls is we're putting specific <coughs> pieces of legislation in place, like the new domestic violence legislation. Um, there have been issues around ring fence funding which we provided to deal with this. This question of sexual harassment, um, I think, is a, a, a taking place in a variety of settings. Is a slightly, as I say, it's a wider issue, and I'm not sure that there is a single, um, if you like, silver bullet answer for the government to introduce that in a strategy or otherwise that is going to deal with this precisely because it is one of the hardest things to deal with which is about culture and attitudes. But there are some specifics aren't there and I'm thinking now about the case of Zelda Perkins who worked for Harvey Weinstein um, but also the case of non-disclosure agreements more widely. You know, should it be a crime to offer money to employees to silence them in relation to a wrongdoing? I think people are pretty astonished at the way non-disclosure agreements are being used in this sort of case. Well, of course, if you look at the, the, um, this issue, if I can, in various layers of this, uh, in relation to um, gagging clauses that try to prevent workers from whistleblowing, i.e. disclosing wrongdoing in a workplace to the relevant authority, potentially the police, but also, um, for example, MPs in the public interest, that's, those are not legally valid or enforceable. Um, now, there are occasions where somebody parts company from an employer where there will be a settlement agreement which can contain a confidentiality agreement, uh, and that can be to provide a way of um, resolving a workplace dispute or ending a relationship without going through the, the, the stress and cost of an employment tribunal. But those confidentiality clauses should go no further than is necessary to protect matters such as client confidentiality and commercial interest. And um, there are various uh, protections on that. The Employment Rights Act 1996 makes settlement agreements unenforceable unless the employee has had independent advice um, in both public and private sectors. Uh, ACAS has a statutory code and practical guidance on settlement agreements that make clear that gagging clauses which attempt to prevent an, or restrict an individual from making a protected disclosure in settlement agreements are not permissible. Um, and we've also produced guidance on settlement agreements and whistleblowing. So I think there are various ways in which we're trying to ensure that these, that these are used in those cases where it is appropriate to use them and where they are used, that they're used properly and not inappropriately. The evidence would be emerging that sometimes they're not used appropriately and often those that are being forced into taking NDAs or agreeing to NDAs would not be aware that they are, as you have rightly said, unenforceable. Will you review the way NDAs are regulated to try and <coughs> stop that happening? After all, we are dealing with the legal profession here, which is a highly regulated profession, possibly misusing NDAs. Well, I'm certainly happy to go away and look at the um, structures that we've got around non-disclosure agreements and the evidence that is coming forward about how they're being used. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. And I know you have another engagement to go to, Prime Minister, but could I just follow up on a letter that I um, uh, sent you last week? And it was uh, following a request from the Chair of the Defence Committee to hear from the National Security Advisor. Um, who is currently declining to attend the committee. And it was just to reiterate that it's the unanimous view of this committee that we feel it's an obstruction to the work of the Defence Committee for him not to appear. And can I ask whether you do have a response to that now, whether you will allow him to attend the Defence Committee? I, well, I'm, I will obviously respond formally to the, uh, to the letter that you sent me. Yes. Um, and I recognise the role that the select committees take. But I think it's important to recognise that the National Security Advisor is an advisor to the National Security Council and to me. He has already provided evidence to Dr Lewis in the Joint Committee on the National Security Strategy. Um, he's coordinating work on the National Security Capability Review. That's what I have asked him and the National Security Council has asked him to do. But his advice will be to me and for the National Security Council to take and be accountable for decisions. Now, when we look at appearances by civil servants, 
um, in, uh, in front of select committees. Of course, it's ministers who are accountable to Parliament, and civil servants give evidence on the basis that they do so on behalf of their minister and under their directions, because it's the minister and not the civil servant who is accountable to Parliament for the evidence that's given to the committee. So, as I see it, Mark is giving evidence to the National Secu a Joint Committee on the National Security Strategy. I think that's where it's appropriate for him to give evidence. He's already done that. If and I may the vote, Prime Minister, he, uh, Julian Lewis only had a few minutes at the Joint Committee, and the Defence Committee are specifically undertaking a review um, of the National Security Capability Review. So they feel that it's very difficult for them to carry out their work without his appearance before them. And there is precedent for this happening, <coughs> um, clear precedent for for the security advisor to appear at defence committees in the past. So, so we feel very strongly that he should appear. So that's what I would like to ask you to consider. Well, I assume that if the defence committee is looking at the National Security Capability Review, it is looking at it in relation to its aspects of defence. Mm -hmm. And the defence secretary and uh, his permanent secretary regularly give evidence to that committee and are happy to do so in relation to that, uh, to that particular issue. That's yeah, but I will write to you, Chairman, and put that uh, put my view in. Yes, in writing. Um, I, mean, I have to say that we are, we're unhappy about that as chairs because we don't see that there would be any harm, but there would certainly be great benefit, and it would really assist the Defence Committee in their work to have um, Mr. Sedwell appear in front of them. And I think we need to establish very clearly what would be the harm in him appearing. Well, it is as I say. It, ministers are accountable to Parliament. Uh, it is ministers decide uh, are able to agree that civil servants who are responsible to, the, for, to them for their areas of activity uh, appear in front of select committees, um, and uh, those civil servants appear in front of the relevant select committee. Mark, I believe that the relevant select committee for the National Security Advisor is the Joint Committee on the National Security Strategy. As I say, aspects of defence will be covered by can be covered by the defence secretary and his permanent secretary in uh, response to the defence committee, as indeed any other departmental secretary of state and their permanent secretary would give evidence to their departmental committee. Um, I know Bernard has a follow-up point. Uh, um, forgive me for intervening on this matter, but I think it's a matter of precedent. The National Security Advisor has appeared in front of other committees and been very helpful. He's appeared in front of uh, the, my predecessor committee, uh, previous National Security Advisor. So that's a matter of precedent. And as a matter of principle, um, it is for select committees to choose who their witnesses should be, and the government should surely assist select committees in that. Um, it is not for the government to decide which witnesses appear before select committees. And that is a principle that this committee has always insisted upon, the um, so-called um, rules, uh, the um, Os Osmovoli rules, <coughs> are the property of the government, they've never been approved by the House, they're not a procedure of the House of Commons, uh, they're something to help government decide who to put in front of select committees, but in the end it is for committees to decide who their witnesses should be. So perhaps you would consider yeah, yeah, those two yes. points. So it's a clear, you make a final clear view of this committee that I'm, we'd ask you formally, ask you to reconsider. <coughs> I'm, I'm, and I'm happy to respond. I note the points that uh, you have made, and I'm I will respond in writing to these points and in, as I respond to the letter that the chairman has sent. But if he can't defend himself before a committee, he shouldn't have the job, should he? He's perfectly <laughs> capable of defending himself before a committee. It's, uh, uh, the, there is, this is a long-standing issue, and it's an issue in all my years at the Home Office. <laughs> that uh, I encountered in terms of the relationship between ministers in Parliament and civil servants in Parliament. And uh, as I say, the Defence Secretary and his Permanent Secretary are well able to give uh, evidence to the Defence Committee on defence aspects of the review. But I will, I've noted the points that have been made and I will respond to them formally in, uh, when I respond in writing, Thank if I may, Chairman. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. So we'd ask you to take away the invitation from this committee to go down in history on all these different yeah. points that we've raised with you today. But, uh, but we also would all like to wish you and Philip and all of your team a very happy Christmas. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah. And thank Merry you Christmas so to everybody. Thank you. And finally, we do hope that you will appear before us again in three months' time. That would be very nice. Thank you. <laughs>
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.